Perfect. So, guys, thank you very much for having me today. Uh, it's going to be a pleasure to doing a deep dive in um, the world of industrial machine learning and data pipelines uh, and going through some of the caveats um, that we found uh, building scalable data pipelines. So, a bit about myself. Uh, my name is Alejandro. I am originally from Mexico, currently based in, in London. Uh, I'm currently head of uh, solutions engineering, solution science at a uh, scale up uh, that is building uh, legal tech systems. Uh, I'm also a chairman at an, a think tank called the Institute for Ethical Machine Learning, uh, as well as uh, involved in several other activities. Um, the company in which I'm working at the moment, Eigen Technologies, is building large scale uh, machine learning for text analysis. Um, so we basically build systems that perform uh, front office, back office automations in finance, insurance, legal. Um, and recently we raised, we raised 17 million to expand R&D and scale. Uh, and a plug uh, we are hiring, so check it out, eigentech.com. Um, I also am leading this think tank which focuses on building frameworks and contributing to industry standards. Uh, the last thing that we built was a machine learning pledge, which is basically eight commitments that as a machine learning engineer uh, you're able to pledge towards so that you build responsible systems. So check it out in ethical.institute. Um, today we're going to be covering a few things. Mainly I want to make sure that people understand some of the caveats in scaling data pipelines. Uh, I'm going to be covering uh, uh, Airflow itself, but most specifically some of its components and some of the concepts around it, as well as introducing the difference between machine learning pipelines and data pipelines, uh, together with a use case. And what better way to learn than actually getting our hands dirty and building a tech startup? Um, so this tech startup is going to be called Crypto ML. We're going to be jumping in the hype train. We're going to be building a large-scale crypto analysis platform, uh, doing heavy compute analysis, transform, fetching, and you know we're going deep running predictions on LSTMs and some other models. And we're going to set the premise on can we survive the 2017 crypto craze when everybody was going crazy and they put their mortgage and all of their savings and then probably lost it. And the data set is, um, you know, all historical data from the top 100 cryptos. Uh, the data goes back uh, from the beginning to uh, September 2017, and then it's over 500,000 uh, fields. The interface that we're going to be using um, is basically a crypto loader that allows you to just basically load some of the cryptocurrencies in a, in a Pandas data frame, and the interface to actually trigger uh, the execution for the predictions. Um, you can find the code in uh, GitHub as well as the slides, so please free, feel free to go there and um, yeah, let's do this. So let's set the premise again. So early crypto beginnings. Imagine we started in our garage, uh, Crypto ML is the name of our company. We built a prototype that impressed people around the world because it was so accurate. Uh, it was quite simple, but you know we managed to raise some VC funding. We got a few million uh, pounds, and you know that actually gets us started to just understand actually what we're doing. Uh, we saw that there was a bunch of machine learning tutorials everywhere, and you know what they've learned is basically that you know it's automatic learning from data examples to predict an output based on a, 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 um, on an input. And an example for this is telling whether a shape is a square or a, tri or a triangle uh, by learning from examples. Uh, more specifically, if we imagine a bunch of shapes uh, in a 2D plot where it's area and perimeter, you would see them scattered across what we would call the feature space. Um, we would then want to learn a function that in this case divides our data inputs, whether it's a square or a triangle. This is more specifically a function where X is the input and M and B are the weights and the bias. Um, we, want to we want to get this function so that when we get a new uh, piece of information, we can predict um, what class is it specifically for this. So we let the machine do the learning, we give it two examples, and then it's going to guess this uh, line. We give it a few more examples, it gets better. A few more examples, and it continues getting better and better by minimizing the cost function. Until we're able to find um, the, the local optimum, and we're able to predict um, a new set of data. Uh, but then the crypto ML devs ask themselves, can we actually use this for our cryptocurrency price data? And this is not yet what we ha have because this is more uh, specifically for classification, not for uh, sequential models. In this case, for sequential models, we want to predict the next time, uh, time step. 
And what better way to predict the next time, ste uh, time step than with the hello world of sequential models and moreover probably machine learning, which is linear regression, uh, which allows us to just fit a line with all the data points that we have and then use that to be able to predict the next uh, point in time. Uh, of course, if we use this, you know, the predicted Bitcoin price would be like millions and millions, uh, you know, from which extrapolating and a lot of people understand that it's not the best way. That doesn't mean that people didn't do it. I'm pretty sure that somebody thought it was going to be a million. Um, but then the crypto ML guys didn't just want to stay with, you know, linear, linear uh, regression. That's, that's, that's boring. You know, we want to jump into deep neural networks. Uh, so they also learned that the function that, that we saw there is the same function that the neuro, the, a, a neuron in a neural network. This is the perceptron function. Um, you know, it's, it's the same where you have like the input uh, plus, you know, the bias with the activation function equals, uh, and, and multiplied by the weights equals the output. Um, so they took one neuron, they stacked a few more to allow for more complex functions. Uh, they added a few layers to give more flexibility for the learning. And then they found some deep learning tutorials where they just get told to add more layers. So they did. And now they were able to, you know, build a, a, a recurrent neural network uh, well, and, and try to move into like, not classification, but more specifically sequential models, where they saw that the only difference is that they had to just roll um, the neural network across time, where instead of just putting your data and trying to understand what the class is, you try to put a specific set of data points to predict the next step. Um, and what you are doing with the um, uh, LSTM is you pass the output of each neuron into the next, um, into the next iteration, which allows the, the neural network to actually create an abstract representation of memory, hence, hence the long, sh uh, short-term memory comes from. And in this case, the cost function is just basically, once I give you an input and you give me the output, did you predict the correct one, right? So in this case, we're predicting text. I give you uh, letter B. It tries to see if the um, actual answer is O, otherwise the cost is, is added. Um, and that's great, right? So, but how do we put this into practice? And this is the question of, you know, we go into reading a tutorial into actually implementing it. And this is where we jump into actual machine learning pipelines. Uh, the machine learning pipeline, you know, the CryptoML team realized that, you know, they couldn't continue by just copy-pasting code from Stack Overflow. They needed to actually get some proper methodology on building their tech. Uh, yeah, and they had to do it properly, build, build with best practices in data science. They found out that uh, machine learning pipelines basically break down into two different workflows. This is basically the first part, which is creating your model, creating your training, or what we did, learning a function uh, and persisting it and then actually using that function to predict new data. And this is a very, very, you know, overgeneralized perspective into it, but, uh, you know, in one way or another, it could, it could you know, uh, be abstracted into those two things. So for the first thing, you know, the actual learning uh, the, and finding the, 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 the function, you would basically go into this generic steps of finding the training data and test data. Um, transforming the input into a way that you could then feed it into um, a, a, a specific model. Um, so this could be vectors, this could be whatever it is, uh, uh, your feature space, and then training your machine learning model with that. Got it. And then uh, persisting the model itself uh, once, once you have that. Um, once you actually have your model trained, you run the accuracy, you're happy with it, it's to a certain level that you, know, you feel that you can deploy it to production, then you're going to start getting some unseen data, try to run it through your model, and get some results. So that is generally uh, how it would look like. Uh, something important to mention is that the two points that I highlighted, the transformation of the data into your features, as well as the, the training of the machine learning model, those are things that are probably the most important thing when actually creating your, your model. You need to focus a lot on improving your, your feature space. So this is basically how you represent your data. In the previous example, for squares and triangles, it was represented as area and perimeter. Those were the features that we were actually using for our model. And the second thing is, is asking what other features can we use? So in terms of shapes, we could say what is the color, what is the number of the corners, uh, et cetera, et cetera, so that you give the model more things that it can learn from. Uh, and furthermore, also, um, you know, understanding your, your actual training uh, uh, data, right? Like you need to make sure that you get a, a representative sample of training data. If you only got like, for example, for cryptocurrency, um, uh, the, the, the numbers themselves of, 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 the, of the cryptocurrency itself, or you just got it for a very specific short uh, time window, you're not gonna be able to generalize as much as you would. 
Um, again, you also need to have reasonable methods to assess accuracy, as well as you know, a relevant model for the type of prediction you're doing. So right, we're, mo we're machine learning experts now, so you can collect your certificate after the talk. You know, this is valid in your LinkedIn or here in VK. I don't know what you guys use here. Uh, the non-tech meetups and parties, you know, not, not non-technical meetups, you know, you can, you know, say that, you put your credentials there, as well as uh, when, whenever you tweet, you know, you can now change that in your title, machine learning expert. Um, so you guys are all sorted. Um, no, but seriously, so now to actually build our pipeline for specifically linear regression, let's take a scikit-learn example. So in this prediction um, um, function, what we're going to do is exactly what we mentioned, right? So we get our transformed data, um, we select the model that we're going to use, in this case, linear regression. Uh, we train our model, and then we choose the unseen data points that we want to predict. Um, and we predict them. We try to give the input and then get an output. In this case, we want to predict the next 10 uh, points in the future. Um, so with a linear model, you just want to get all of, the, all of the cryptocurrency data and be like, okay, so what is going to be the next 10 days based on the extrapolation? Um, and then we, when we can use it with the um, uh, crypto loader, uh, we see that we're, we're able to uh, predict the date and the price. Um, now, going deep with our deep neural network, um, with our LSTM, it is basically the same process, right? So we generate the transformed data, in this case, you know, is, is the um, LSTM uh, data for the, for, that we're going to be using for training. In this case, we're using the, a, win, a, a sliding window of 50, so we're training uh, the, 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 the neural network by giving it 50 and trying to predict the next one and then sliding another and trying to predict the next one, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then we select the model. In this case, we just generate uh, um, the LSTM model, train, train it, and then you know, we just predict. Uh, it's very similar. Just disclaimer, um, I wouldn't recommend anyone actually putting money on this model. I mean, this is just something I put together. It works, but I mean, whether it's accurate, I mean, you, you can assess. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's not too different, right? Like, I mean, ultimately, it is the same method. And, and of course, I moved it a little bit, I simplified, but it is ultimately in a machine learning pipeline. That is the, the standard way that you would approach it. And then you can also check the code for, to build the LSTM in, in, the, in, in GitHub. Uh, and when you run it, again, you know, it's successful, it works. Um, but it's important to note that in this specific case, we're actually running the training and the extraction or prediction on the same function. In, in practice, you would actually separate these two workflows, right? You would have your data scientists would create the models, you would, they would be happy with them, and then once you, you, you're happy with that, you would deploy it to production um, in, in this, in this kind of like pipeline workflow. Also, it's important to not underestimate hidden complexities uh, because a lot of the times, people that actually build a machine learning model, you know, they feel that that is it, but there's a lot of complexity actually staging and deploying the models, uh, storing the data in standardized formats, uh, which is a question that is still, you know, uh, being tackled in different ways by different people, abstracting the interfaces for different machine learning libraries as you, you know, grow, uh, distributing your load across the infrastructure, you know, minimizing idle resource utilization, node failure backup strategies, testing of your, of your you know, machine learning models and what's the right way of doing it, as well as monitoring, and the list goes on and on and on. But we're not going to bother to that at this point in time because, you know, we're, we're in the crypto space and we need to move fast. So now that the, the CryptoML guys created their deep learning pipeline, are we done then? Well, not yet. So we're going to go distributed as the CryptoML guys were caught using deep learning. So they were featured in the top 10 global news, TechCrunch. You know, like everybody was like, oh my God, these guys are hot. You need to invest in them. So the user base exploded. Now they have quite a few, um, you know, thousand users come in every day and their actual infrastructure is barely coping. So they should have seen it coming because machine learning is known for being very compute heavy and often is forgotten how also memory heavy it is. Um, Scaling to bigger instances, more RAM is also very expensive. It's actually better to have you know, um, you know, everything distributed if, if possible. Um, and here is where we introduce a solution for this that is in Python. Celery, very, very nice technology, is distributed a synchronous task queue uh, for Python. And in order for, for, for exp uh, uh, the explanation is, is basically a simple uh, producer-consumer architecture. Um, this is basically uh, you're having uh, a queue in the middle. This is specifically RabbitMQ. Um, and you have several producers submitting jobs and several uh, workers actually picking them up and executing them. This could be something as simple as our deep predict function or something more complex. But we're going to see how, how you're able to actually do this. So in order for us to create our consumer, um, the, the one that is going to be running, listening for anyone asking for tasks, what we're going to do is we're going to choose the code that we want to actually predict. We are going to um, Celerize it. So here I'm going to explain how we do it. We just uh, connect Celery into the RabbitMQ backend. Um, we then uh, use the decorator to say that this task is distributed. 
we then um, you know, make sure that all of our uh, inputs to the function, as well as the return, is serializable and is serialized. So I'm using pickle dump to all, in order for, for you know, serializing this. And in this specific case, what we're doing is just getting the prices. right? And then we're just running the exact same thing and just returning it. So very, very simple. The last thing is just you need to run it. You would be able to run this in multiple different servers. And they're connecting to the queue, and they're just listening. And they're like, I am this you know, worker with these capabilities. I'm going to listen if there's any jobs that I need to do. Fine. We're halfway there. What, how do we create now our producer? In this case, we have a, a function that just goes into all of the cryptocurrencies and then triggers uh, deep predict. This is not doing it in Celery. This is just actually doing it in code. It's going to run through all of them, do a prediction, and then run through all of them and, and print it. But in order for us to just make it um, in order for us to make it distributed, the only thing that we need to do is actually just get the function that we created, the worker. Remember that we actually created deep predict. And the only difference is that we're going to run deep predict dot delay. Instead of just calling the function, we're just running it with dot delay. And that basically just triggers it in a, in a delayed way. And afterwards, uh, here what we do is we actually do the, the, re the result, we do dot get which means that it actually waits until it finishes. Normally, you wouldn't really wait. I mean, otherwise, there wouldn't be any point of you actually making it distributed. Um, and then once it gets all of them, then it actually just goes and prints them. Um, and then the last step is actually just running your producer, which is going to just put all of the tasks in the queue, and then the workers are going to listen to them. The good thing is that the workers actually run on every single core of your uh, computers. But you need to be conscious that if your computer is very memory heavy, you need to make sure that um, you know how many cores and how many workers you're running. Because if suddenly it picks up four tasks at a time, it might actually clog the, serv uh, the server. Um, and of course, another good thing is that you can actually visualize it, which actually looks, um, allows you to see how many tasks are running um, and you know, be able to uh, debug the stuff that, that you see. And you can run more producer and consumers. It's very easy to scale, um, which is great. So now we're distributed. You know, are we done? Not yet, so now we actually jump into the smart data pipelines. We actually have an exponentially increasing amount of internal use cases, and the data pipeline is getting unmanageable. They also realize that machine learning is only the tip of the iceberg. You know, machine learning is that little black box over there. Everything else is things that you actually need to be aware in order for that to operate uh, successfully. And people often forget that you know, only a small fraction is actual machine learning in real code. And as the, as the growing data flow complexity you know, appears, you know, there is a, a bigger need to pull data from different sources. There is a growing need to pre and post process data. Complexity increases you know, depending tasks depending on others finishing and getting the output of those. Uh, and then if a task fails, you, know, you wouldn't want to run the children tasks. So you need to be aware of all of these things. You know, some of these tasks also need to be triggered on a schedule. You want to make sure that it runs every day or every week or every hour. Um, and then data pipelines can get really, really com complex. You know, having just cellarized tasks is just not enough. You know, and really, we want to go from here, which I hope you know, nobody really wants to be on a cron tab with all of your tasks just set there, which end up being a complete mess, maybe just written in like the whiteboard if you're lucky. Uh, into something nicer, right? Something that you can actually track, monitor, visualize, and manage the dependencies of. Uh, but before jumping in into how, uh, how there's tools that would allow you to manage your airflow, pi uh, your, your data pipelines, I want to clear uh, a, a distinction that is often confused. The difference between data pipelines and machine learning pipelines. I'm in providing a, a breakdown of these definitions. So machine learning pipelines themselves could be said that they're a subset of data pipelines. Data pipelines is a very generic term, which basically stands for anything requir requiring, you know, taking data from somewhere, doing something with it, and then putting the results back somewhere else. This is basically it, right? So ETL sort of workflows, where you know this encompasses the machine learning process because actually the part of doing something with the data could be actually sending it to a prediction engine and then getting the results, putting the results somewhere else. So machine, the machine learning pipeline could be just one part of the many things that your data pipeline would be able to do. And also data pipelines, the concept, encompasses other um, complexity and other, other concepts. Uh, this includes scalability of it, the monitoring, the latency, versioning, uh, testing, uh, deployment, all of these things that need to be taken into consideration when running production level uh, data pipelines. And thankfully, we have tools actually to help us with this. Um, introducing Airflow. Uh, so Airflow itself is, uh, is what I call the, the Swiss Army 
uh, uh, knife of data pipelines as it does everything or at least most of the things that you would want it to do. Um, but before I jump into, into, into the things that Airflow does, I want to make clear what Airflow is not. Because a lot, of, a lot of times people may actually jump into trying to use it when they may actually not need it. So Airflow is, is not perfect. It's, it's far from perfect. But at the same time, for some reason, it's still the best out there. Right? Whenever you find yourself developing on it, you're going to be like, why am I using it? But in reality, it's still the, the best that at least I've come across. Um, you know, it's also not a Lambda slash function as a service framework, um, although you can actually program it to be, but it's not really function as a service framework. It's also not very mature. So it was developed by Airflow, um, hence the name. Um, and, and it's currently in incubation in Apache. Um, and that means that it's going through a lot of changes. It will be you know, used a lot. But even then, there's still a lot of big names using it in production and contributing to it, which is actually really good. Um, it's also, again, not fully stable. So you need to make sure that if you use it, you're ready for the migration that's coming soon, relatively soon. When 2.0 gets released, some changes, breaking changes will be um, you know, introduced. And you're going to have to migrate or you're going to um, stay. This actually reminds me a lot of the Angular 2, Angular 1.7 uh, release when you know everybody just like jumped on the train and then they released that and then everybody just left to react, um, which you know we hope that it doesn't happen here as well. But but yeah, so just be bear in mind, uh, whatever is not as well is not a data streaming solution. However, you can augment it with something like Storm and, and, and Spark streaming. So now let's dive into now that we know what Airflow is not, and now let's dive into the gray area of what Airflow may be. Um, Airflow itself is a data pipeline framework. It's written in Python. It has a very active community, and it has a very, very strong UI that allows for management. Um, the core unit of, 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 of work within Airflow is, is its DAGs, as they call them. This is basically directed uh, acyclic graphs that define the actual flow of data and operations of your entire uh, you know, system. Um, the definition of them is actually by just you know, defining the, the, the DAG with a name, um, a schedule, a start date, uh, defining a bunch of operators, which I'm going to cover in a bit, and then actually stating the order in which the operators can actually be executed. In this case, you can actually see that the operators, you know, we have a very complex uh, workflow that is being executed. Um, Airflow itself also has a scheduler. So instead of actually using something like cron tab, you can use the, the default scheduler that it comes with. And it not only provides you with an ability to, to you know, provide the schedule, so you can see there that the, form, the format of the definition is also like cron tab. Um, but you can see all of the tasks that you know, are, are currently being executed, have succeeded, have failed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it does seem a little bit confusing at first, but it, it's a pretty solid interface. Um, the DAGs themselves, um, each unit of work is called an operator, and the operators are basically wrappers for either Python logic or any other type of logic. This could be logic to connect to a, um, you know, some HDFS system. It could be logic to download tweets, uh, download you know pictures from I don't know VK or whatever. Um, and Airflow itself provides a very broad set of default uh, operators for you to start using for. Uh, the one that you will find yourself using most of the times is the Python operator. Um, data also can be passed downstream as well as hold data across the context of one DAG execution. What this means is that you can, for example, uh, take the, give the ID to the beginning task and then have the operators make sure that they pass the output of the previous one forward and forward and forward. And you can also visualize the, the, the um, parameters that get passed uh, as it's called X, XCOM. Um, and this is something that um, you know, you'll be able to, 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 to use very, very extensively. Um, and then Airflow is very, very modular. So I think one of the most uh, um, you know, attractive parts of Airflow is the fact that it does a clear separation between the operator logic and its DAG definition which makes it much, much more testable and more reusable. So the, the ethos of Airflow is that you would define all of your operators separately. And based on the operators that you've defined, you would then be able to create these workflows um, and reuse the operators, as well as reuse the DAGs that you've created as, as sub-DAGs. Right? So you can actually um, reuse a lot of the, the functionality. Here, what we're doing is we're basically just defining the DAG with a name. Uh, we are creating a, a push function. Uh, which basically just you know pushes an object to the next operator. 
Then a pull function that basically you know, retrieves uh, anything that is in the context that ha might have been passed by the previous task. Um, and what we're doing here is just, you know, we're returning the value. And, you know, in the second one, we're actually just retrieving that same value. Then the third one, we're just creating two operators with a Python operator. This basically just says, you know, this is going to be an operator, use this Python function. And then at the end, we're just stating that, you know, the push task goes before the pull task. As simple as that, right? So now we've actually created a DAG that you know, has, the, has you know, the order in which it's going to execute. It has data that is going to pass downstream. And if the task number one fails, the second task is not going to execute. And then you can also visualize this on the, on the UI um, as it's executing through the uh, tree view and the subcomponents. So this may, again, you know, I think you know, design is probably not one of the core things of, of, of Airflow, but you know, it provides a lot of the complexity in here. So here you're seeing the actual flow of the, of, the, of the graph itself. And then here you're seeing for every single execution, you know, whether an execution was successful or not. And this is basically whether each of the steps have been uh, successfully completed. Right? So you can actually see how everything is, is being executed. Again, um, just um, to mention some of the things that you're seeing here. Um, the types of operators, the basic types that you are going to find yourself using is, of course, the Python operator, but there's also something called sensors, right? The sensors are basically uh, operators that, when triggered, they will continue executing themselves every certain amount of time defined as you, you know, customized def define, and it's going to do an action until it returns true. So it's going to continuously, for example, pull for another engine until it's actually done. And then you have all the things like branch operators that allow you to actually branch off and do something else. And if that is not awesome enough, um, the actual uh, backend for this default one can also be used as, uh, using Celery, which allows you to actually you know, make sure that your airflow uh, execution is done using a RabbitMQ um, and utilizing all of the workers that you actually uh, would be running. So you would actually have several servers that are uh, specifically uh, being connected to the queue, listening for Airflow tasks to be executed. And you can also use different backends. Uh, Airflow is very extensible, so you can write your own operators, hooks, executors, macros, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And with that in mind, now we're going to jump into a practical use case where the crypto ML team, they want a workflow where they're going to pull some crypto data every day. They're going to transform that data and standardize it. They're, once it's ready, they're going to send it to a prediction engine where they want to actually get the predicted price. They want to they then do two actions, which is basically store it in the database, and depending on the rules, maybe um, execute a trade. So with that in mind, let's break this down into airflow terminology. So for each of the, of the cryptocurrencies, say we get Bitcoin, what we want to do is we want to you know, have a Python operator. The Python operator is going to transform and standardize the data. It's going to then you know, pass the next operator. It's going to send the, the, uh, op uh, the data into the crypto engine for prediction. Then it's going to trigger a sensor. This sensor would actually ping the uh, crypto engine that may be an external service and ping until it actually you know, gets a positive poll saying that it's finished. And once it's finished, then it's going to pull the, the outcomes or at least you know, trigger the next operator, which then would be a branch. This branch would execute the store, uh, the, the operator that would just store it on the database. The operator could be a Postgres uh, operator, and then the other one that would actually assess the rules and then execute the trade. Uh, furthermore, for the actual overarching workflow that you would have, um, you would want to have an initial operator that would be continuously pulling. This itself would actually be a scheduler. So in Airflow, you would go into the main menu and you would trigger a specific function to be able to um, pull whether there's new data. And whenever there's new data for, say, five cryptocurrencies, you would be able to trigger dynamically several of these subtags. Um, if, if you actually um, you know, try to do this, you will, you will find that, again, you run into several limitations of Airflow. Um, Airflow doesn't allow for dynamic DAG creation when you don't know the exact number of DAGs that you're going to have at runtime. And this is very painful it's because you, you can still do it, but you would have to do it with the, with, with the session interacting with the API. And, and this is very hacky, and they've recognized that it's very hacky. Um, but again, you know, I think there's a lot of these little things that you're going to stumble upon, and you will see that you know, it, it's, it's not ideal, and you're going to have to write yourself several walkarounds. So here is kind of like the, the overview of the stuff that we did.
so the, the operators, the sensors, and the branch operators that we would have defined, and then how they would actually um, you know, be, be taken forward you know, use, using Airflow. And with that, that's success for the crypto ML guys. Um, and I do recommend you guys to go check it out. Now it's in Apache, so Airflow is, 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 you know, I would say documentation is not the greatest thing that it currently has, and it's not fully up to date, but they're trying, you know, they're trying. You know, even before actually going into any tutorials, I would actually advise you for you to download the documentation, the PDF documentation, and just read it. That's actually probably more complete and better than most of the tutorials that are available, and you're gonna learn about the limitations of it. But it is, it is very simple. You know, it, it's, it's literally like you know, a few, two hours of, of going through it, and you'll have probably most of the, 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 the core fundamentals to, to get started. And you could actually read the code, uh, the, the source code, which is not extensive, to see like how it, how it works. It's a very thin layer. Um, again, be careful with the, with the rewrite that is coming, uh, but I do encourage for you to use it, and I wouldn't you know, uh, advise against um, you know, using it in production. It's also worth mentioning a few uh, alternatives. So some people that have might actually work with ETL um, or, or data pipeline workflows, uh, probably have encountered things like Luigi or, or Pimble. Um, I mean, ultimately, they, this, this, these tools are quite good. I mean, Luigi is very, very well maintained. I think the only thing is that um, with Luigi, the, 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 the logic for the, the, the graph and the execution graph is very coupled with the logic of the operators themselves. Um, it's also very hard to test. So um, ultimately, you know, it's little, little tiny things that make Airflow better. It's not significantly better and, you know, by a large amount. Um, and then think, there, there's other things that are much more com complex that are focusing even a bit more on the machine learning side, like Seldon Core. Um, I do recommend checking it out. This is basically a distributed machine learning uh, execution and monitoring framework uh, and deployment framework uh, running on, Doc, uh, on Kubernetes and, and Docker. Uh, it, it saves the models as Docker images. Um, it has its own kind of like paradigm, uh, but it's very, very interesting and they've been doing some really cool work. And other similar but different, um, you know, frameworks. Uh, Dask is one that comes, uh, uh, you know, across very often and people, you know, get confused of where should they use something like Airflow or Dask. Um, I think, you know, ultimately, if you, are, if, you, if you are looking to optimize a specific, you know, computation, uh, and distribute like the, the actual data uh, structures within the, the, the system itself, probably something like Dask, if you're actually looking to uh, have horizontally distributed um, you know, execution of, of isolated um, ETL sort of workflows, then probably something like um, Airflow or Luigi would be more relevant. Um, and then there's other things. I actually received the question uh, in another conference of, you know, why not using Apache Kafka instead? But I would say that, you know, pr uh, publisher subscribe, um, you know, frameworks like this would be more of like running on, on the side. They probably would also have a different use case. Um, and of course, special mentions, uh, Docker and Kubernetes, they're great. Um, don't have time to cover them in this, in this presentation, but there are some implementations of um, these and, and the, the, the files themselves. Um, like Docker Compose files for this um, in, in the code base, so do check it out. Um, and yeah, what's next for CryptoML? So as with any other startup, you know, they're continuously going through the, through the roller coaster, so this is only the beginning for them. And for us, you know, we got an overview in scaling data pipelines, you know, covering an overview of the Airflow components and uh, understanding the difference between machine learning and data pipelines, as well as, you know, a, a use case to go and see how, how it gets executed. Again, the code, you can find it in my GitHub, so do check it out. And uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And thank you. Bienvenido a Russia. And a little, <laughs> little question. Uh, how scalable the solution is? And what backends uh, have you tried? I talked about uh, RabbitMQ February, but have you tried another queues and maybe works uh, like Apache Kafka, <laughs> as you said? And uh, what uh, maybe real performance per core or per machine uh, have you achieved? Thank you very much. Cool. Okay. So let's uh, expand that. Um, in terms of um, trying different technologies, um, so what we do is we actually separate our machine learning from uh, our machine learning pipeline from our data pipeline mainly because um, the machine learning pipeline is very specific to running you know, training of models and then running extraction. Um, I mean, a disclaimer is, you know, we don't use deep learning models, so we actually focus mainly on probabilistic models, and we spend a lot of time on, on the features that, that we would use, uh, which results in, in 
quite significant, uh, significantly heavy, uh, you know, exec processing, right? So we actually need to use very heavy instances. Um, in terms of the performance, the reason why uh, for for the actual, um, you know, distributed of, of the load, we used Celery. Uh, because we use Celery for both our machine learning pipeline and our, um, you know, data pipelines, is because, um, you know, it, number one, we use mainly Python. So the fact that it was very Python native, it's written in Python, it is, it was really good because um, we also are able to dive into the source code uh, and either contribute or, you know, write a quick fix for anything that we think is needed. Um, and then in terms of Airflow itself, um, it, there, there's not much more advantage when it comes to performance. I mean, the performance wins. You get them from optimizing your your um, your, your the, the, the function itself, from optimizing the the, the way that you uh, retrieve your models, the way that you execute the the, the processing and the extraction. Um, so I would I would recommend that um, you know you, you probably use the tool that is more relevant for what you're using, and specifically for performance uh, metrics that we've gained, we didn't really. Uh, perform a very extensive review. It was more from what we could find online, and pretty much everything said what I'm presenting right now. It, it said like, look, you know, comparing Luigi with Airflow, you know, these are the advantages. Uh, you know, having something like Kafka, you know, you would probably, you know, n you would focus on a different use case. Um, as, and, and specifically for Airflow, you know, because we have already a lot of stuff in Python, it was a very obvious decision. Um, so it was more for us like, you know, it was between Airflow, uh, pinball or Luigi, so we just ended up deciding going for Airflow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, now it won't be a question, so in, it, it will be in Russian and I'll translate it later. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much for... Okay, sorry, I very much speak English. If you want to interest about Apache Airflow, то мы с коллегами из Mail.ru, я сам из МТС, уже на протяжении полугода-года пытаемся построить русскоязычное сообщество. Есть телеграм-канал, не канал, группа, в котором уже примерно 150 человек, и мы общаемся, учимся, патчим, пишем плагины. Я скину сейчас в общий чатик конференции ссылку, если кому-то интересно, подключайтесь. Yeah, so there is a Russian community uh, for air, uh, about Airflow. Oh, wow. And, yeah, and uh, Maxim will provide a link, Telegram link to everyone. Awesome. I want to join. Let's do it. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I want to ask about uh, salary. Uh, I think um, it's... Um, um, why uh, uh, do you use uh, Celery uh, instead of Spark, for example? Because I think for distributing uh, Spark maybe is better. And my second question, re really quick, uh, what is best practice um, for case when you release uh, a new model, version of model? And I know about uh, for all a little bit, and I know about uh, back few jobs. Uh, and when you want to compare your new model and your um, previous model, you need to um, to calculate uh, for previous uh, for new model previous uh, results uh, and compare it. Uh, what is the best practice? How to um, store results and etc. Thank you very much. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So I guess for the first question, why Earth and not Spark? Um, I think, um, you know, I agree that, that Spark is, is quite good when it comes to, you know, computing huge, huge loads in a distributed manner. But I think for, for a startup um, to, you know, be able to get started with like a, a, a HDFS server and have the entire Hadoop infrastructure to be able to like, you know, run Spark efficiently. I think with, with um, something like, you know, with AWS is now much more feasible. But, you know, ultimately for a lot of the work that we do, for example, it needs to be on premise. Um, it needs to be on, on, on bare metal, on servers. We can't really use Google Cloud or Azure or some of those. Um, so the complexity of deployment and setup, it actually um, you know, is taken into account a lot. I think it's definitely getting easier to actually just go and set up the, 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 the clusters that you, are re that you require for that. But you know, when it comes to something like Airflow, running it um, uh, you know, in, in production 
scaling it is, is extremely simple. You know, you, you really don't need to have even somebody specialized in, in managing that, in, in monitoring, in, in, in enhancing it, extending it. The developers themselves actually can manage the entire complexity. So I think, I think that was one of the, the, the bigger ones. I think when, when we, I mean, as a startup right now, we're around 50, 60 people. Uh, once the complexity grows and we have much more data and we have much more of a business drive, I think we'll start you definitely using things like Spark. But I still don't think it will be just Spark. You know, I feel that we're still going to manage our ETL workflows using things like Airflow and you know use Spark as an endpoint to actually like you know run some specific very heavy tasks. And so that's for the first part. Um, now for the second part, um, the the how do you manage versioning and what best practices are uh, you know are there? Uh, you know if if, if I stood here and I told you what the best practices are. You know, I would be lying because I don't think anyone has really found that out. And there's a lot of people really trying to figure it out, like in terms of the the, the actual model specifically uh, of of you know um, you know um, uh, interpretability and 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 you know understanding from from you know very complex models like like deep learning. H however, something that I would say is that you shouldn't focus as much in that. Area right, reduce the number of of, of well, the, reduce the, the actual complexity. Uh, what you can do instead, and what most people do, is they actually build a representation of the model. So this would be what are the features that you store, what are the, the labels that you give, and what are the training that goes in, right? And and even though this is not the actual you know uh, binary of the of the trained model, this is basically all of the things that you need to recreate that model. Uh, that is in terms of versioning. That allows you to actually hold a lot of version control. There was this talk that was talking about like uh, some guys that that um, actually uh, branched off Git, the GitHub, uh, well Kit, and and they actually created um, um, a, um, a version control system for features and 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 the models that they're using. And then just to to finish off that question, um, I think that in terms of evaluating the models, again, you know, I wouldn't really evaluate them by you know doing something more, more much more complex than by you know m spending more time assessing your trained test data that allows you to be more um, you know sure that your 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 data that you're using for your model is comprehensible and representative of the data you will see in production right and then that way you can have much more objective assessments of 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 accuracy and how improved your model is on each version mm -hmm. thank you very much mm -hmm. The last question. Right, thank you for the talk. Uh, I've got two questions. Um, so uh, we, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, uh, so we use Kronos um, at, at the firm I currently work for, and um, we've had lots of issues around expressing proper alerting when jobs fail. So for example, um, often you have transient network issues, you might try to download, a job might try to download a file from S3, but for some reason some failover of some S3 node that means that you know, we get an error and the whole, the whole job crashes. And so we want that to retry. Uh, but there are situations where depending on how it fails, you don't want it to retry because it doesn't make sense to retry. Um, so does Airflow have any way of expressing retries? Um, does it have any built-in alerting support? Um, what do you, do you do to handle like failed jobs and, and transient network issues and things like that? Oh, cool. And what's the second question? Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Oh, fine, fine. Okay, cool. Um, so I think um, that's that's a very good question, and I think I think the answer is probably um, not what you expect. It's it's probably very similar to what you guys have to do with Kronos. So the answer is yes. Airflow does provide some basic. Um, you know, stat, uh, state monitoring, where if one task fails, the one that follows won't execute. And, and then again, you can actually visualize it and use the UI to see what task failed, when you can click, you can see what the logs are. That is very, very nice. However, what we had to do is we had to build our own framework on top of the Airflow framework. So we actually have our own database that monitors all this, the state of the system at all times. So even though we actually do benefit from the fact that Airflow doesn't execute a task after it fails, y you would still find yourself having to create your own way to actually manage the, the complex states of the system and how to handle when something fails. So I would say that it is much better in terms of it, pro it provides you with a, with a solid base, but you know I would say that you know, it only provides you with a best practice base. You would have to build everything else on top. Right, yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Well, any more questions at the pub?
Stoyan. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro.